All right. Um, so welcome everybody to our Health Intersections Learning Community. Um, it's our first group meeting. I'll talk a little bit about the um, format of this open learning community here in a few minutes. Um, but this is kind of the agenda of our meeting today. And so we're going to do a little bit of an intro to let you all know what a learning community is. Um, and uh, in case you haven't been involved in one of these before. And uh, then we'll introduce our subject matter experts for today. And um, then they will go ahead and take over and do their presentation. And then we'll show you some different tools and resources that you can use moving forward um, with this learning community. And so um, our learning community resource center, we have several different groups. Um, some of them are open, some of them are closed based on uh, the topic. And really the purpose of these learning communities is to analyze community action outcomes and identify effective, promising, and innovative practice models that alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty. So it's all about building agencies' capacity um, to really um, address those causes and conditions um, in their local communities. And so this national webinar series focuses on the um, connections within the health sphere. And so um, the intersections we're going to be focusing on, obviously today we're focusing on the social determinants of health. Um, we're going to be focusing on the intersection of health and housing on May 31st. And then we're going to be focusing on the intersection between health and substance abuse on June 22nd. Uh, we'll also have one more uh, learning community uh, national webinar in July, but we'd like to leave that up to um, you all or your colleagues to help us choose that final topic. Um, and so we're going to actually be sending out a survey after this webinar to all the attendees to help us determine what that final topic will be. So the format of this webinar um, series or this learning community, um, we're going to have four monthly webinars through July. And these are going to be national and open to everyone. Um, then we're going to have a survey, of just, like I just talked about, to gain some feedback and information from the participants. We're going to have some peer-to-peer -peer learning subgroups after each um, topic webinar. And this would be for anyone who's interested in engaging further in the topic, so with a more of a close-knit group on the phone, um, so that peers can learn from each other, share best practices, um, get a little bit of um, coaching or mentoring from the subject matter experts, and um, you know, be able to really have that um, more in-depth conversation. And then we're also going to have resources available um, via Basecamp, which is a um, kind of a project management resource sharing site. And so uh, you'll have access to that after this webinar. I'll add everyone to that group. And then we'll also have a capstone session at our annual convention in Philadelphia in August. And so um, we'll have kind of a final learning community group meeting um, that anyone that's participated would be open to come to, as well as um, another session on um, the health intersection. So our LCRC team at the Community Action Partnership National Office, um, we have Jarl Crocker, he's the Director of Training and Technical Assistance. Um, Tiffany Marley is our Project Director, and I'm logged in to, um, under her account right now, even though it shows my face, but says Tiffany Marley. Um, and then I'm Courtney Kohler, I'm a senior associate with the partnership. And then we also have Hyacinth McKinley, who's a program associate for the Learning Community Resource Center. So we always like to start out our meetings with the promise of community action. So I would invite you all to go ahead and um, say this at your seat or read through it as I go. So community action changes people's lives, embodies a spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. All right, so just an audio check-in. Um, I assume and hope that everyone can hear me well. I don't think I've gotten any chat messages saying that you cannot. Um, but if you have trouble um, hearing me at any point or you're not seeing the slides, um, please enter that into the chat window. We'll also be using the chat window for questions. And what I encourage you to do is as you go along, um, if you have a question, go ahead and enter it into the chat. And we'll um, pause um, periodically throughout the webinar, probably after each presenter, to see if anybody has any questions. Um, and so everyone is muted at this point, um, just to kind of cut down on that background noise. Um, but what we can do is we can unmute you from this end if you end up wanting to engage with the participant. Um, and we'll kind of facilitate those questions, though, from here. All right. Um, so just to introduce our subject matter experts that we have 
Um, today we have Dr. Aaron Lapata, and he is from the Health Resources and Services Administration. And we ha also have Dr. Dana Long, and she's from um, the Children's Hospital in Oakland, California. Um, and they're going to be sharing some of their expertise with us today. So um, again, as you know, we're going to be focusing on these social determinants of health, um, and there's just so much that goes into um, you know, determining health later on in life. And so we're going to learn a little bit about that today and what some different um, people in the field are working on. So what I'm going to do now is um, go ahead and pass this over to Aaron, and he will give us um, his presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Courtney. I, I appreciate that. And um, I just want to thank uh, Cap for giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you. And, and really what I'm going to be doing here is mostly it's just an uh, introduction to the star um, presenter today, which is Dr. Dana Long, uh, who will talk about the great, amazing, really amazing work they're doing um, uh, uh, in Oakland um, to address uh, social determinants of health. I wanted to give a, a brief introduction to what uh, we do here at the federal level. Um, again, my, uh, I'm, um, as Courtney said, I'm a, uh, Aaron Lapata. I'm a Chief Medical Officer for Maternal and Child Health Bureau at HRSA. Uh, and I just wanted to take a couple minutes and, and give you an overview of what the Maternal and Child Health Bureau does. Um, uh, our mission uh, at the Bureau is to improve the health of all mothers, children, and, and families. And to um, achieve that, um, we have our, our core values are to work to ensure that every child and every family have a fair shot at re reaching their fullest potential. And uh, through that, we, uh, our grants um, and contracts uh, support family-centered and community-based systems of services. And of course, uh, the highlight of the, this discussion, uh, one of the, the primary uh, core uh, missions of our Bureau is to address social determinants of health and to eliminate health disparities. Um, so MCHB uh, has long recognized that social determinants uh, um, as they, they are the real drivers of health disparities in maternal and child health uh, and social determinants such as poverty, lack of housing, or education. Um, and one thing that we do here at the federal level is we work close with other federal agencies uh, to ensure that federal resources, whether they're federal resources from housing, education, uh, child care, uh, labor, uh, any federal resources at the community level are aligned to support at-risk families uh, with, the again, the mission to reduce economic insecurity, increase employment opportunities, and improve educational outcomes. Uh, and again, this is a very interesting, you know, it, it seems obvious, but, um, you know, we are a health, we are with an HHS, Health and Human Services, um, and we're obviously the Maternal Child Health Bureau, but uh, what we've understood for a long time is that while uh, you know, we do a lot of work uh, to help uh, families uh, uh, find medical homes, ensure that uh, women are engaged in prenatal care and children are, uh, have regular uh, um, uh, health care. Um, you know, that's the clinical care is only part of it, uh, of, this, of, the, of what helps us to ensure that families and children uh, are healthy and are uh, succeeding and thriving. And for that to happen, um, it can't just be uh, ensuring that they have access to medical care, though that is absolutely critical, let me get it wrong. Uh, we also need to make sure that they, their other uh, social determinants are addressed. And if those social determinants aren't addressed, uh, then, um, uh, then they will not be able to uh, uh, thrive uh, or succeed, um, or it makes it much more difficult to do so. Uh, so MCHB works uh, directly, in addition to working with our federal partners uh, to align policy, uh, MC, MCHB has a number of uh, grants uh, uh, and activities that directly uh, address social determinants, as these programs are you know, mostly community-based. Uh, so one of our biggest programs probably is the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. This is about $400 million a year, grants go to every state uh, uh, and all territories uh, to um, uh, provide, uh, to contract out with um, home visiting uh, models that are evidence-based to provide home visiting services for um, at-risk families and at-risk women uh, um, um, before um, they give birth during prenatal um, and uh, uh, around perinatal and um, in the, uh, and they usually stay, the home visitors stay with the families up to like two or three years of age. So really staying with the families, providing them uh, guidance, case management, uh, and um, uh, 
and, and helping them connect to like critical services that they require. Um, and then another program we have is Healthy Start, which uh, is a program that provides grants directly to organizations within communities. And they do work similar to home visiting in the sense that they do have home visitors going to uh, houses, home visits to uh, at-risk families, uh, and they provide intensive case management again <clears throat> uh, to those families before, uh, uh, during, and after uh, pregnancy. Um, uh, and uh, they also, any family that is enrolled in Healthy Start or gets home visits also receives a standardized comprehensive assessment that considers physical and behavioral health. And again, they address employment issues, housing, domestic violence risks, and more. Uh, and so just like home, the home visiting program, Healthy Start, uh, you know, these are place-based, uh, community-based programs that really work directly with families and uh, help them, not only to help them connect to healthcare, uh, which is, again, is critical, but also um, um, screens for uh, social determinant problems and addresses social determinants. Um, and then the last thing I was wanted to mention is we also do, and I should say the Healthy Start program is 103 million a year. So these are big programs. Um, and I think we have like 117 uh, uh, communities across the country that home visiting works in. Uh, and then we also have a rural health, uh, the rural impact program. And this is a, a smaller, it's only uh, about $300,000 to provide technical assistance to uh, 10 rural communities uh, across the country. And the objective here is to uh, work uh, with our colleagues in other agencies, um, uh, housing, labor, education, um, uh, uh, and, and child care, uh, uh, this administration with children and families uh, covers a lot of child care and Head Start, and working together to ensure that all the federal resources are aligned in these communities and working with a group in, in, the, in these communities to help them align those resources and ensure that at-risk families can access these resources and that they have sort of a, a no wrong door approach. So anywhere they walk into uh, a, a, a service organization in the community, whether it's Head Start or a job training program for, for adults, they will also be plugged in or be made aware of other services for, uh, for um, their children um, and parents. We call it a two-generation approach. Uh, so we are addressing the concerns uh, and the needs of both children uh, and their parents. Uh, because we also, another thing that we realize is that if you only address the concerns of the children, the parents aren't doing well, well, the children aren't going to thrive. And so this is a two-generation approach that the rural health, I'm sorry, this rural impact uh, demonstration uh, um, tries to address. And again, it's a demonstration, it's only 10 communities, but this is the kind of work that we think is critical uh, it's one thing to have, uh, it's important to have individual grants and services provided in these communities, but it's also critical to make sure that these uh, services are aligned uh, and that uh, families have, uh, know about these services and they can access them. And that's why we work directly with these groups in these communities to help do that. Um, and so with that, I, I wanted to, to hand this over to Dr. Dana Long, who um, is doing really incredible work, uh, um, as you'll see, uh, her, and her and her team to address the social determinants um, of her, of patients that come to their clinic uh, in Oakland. Um, and they have a, a really amazing tool uh, that allows them to uh, do this and, and to identify, you know, uh, social determinants of health and or problems with patients that they help those patients address outside the clinic. Uh, it which really makes all the difference in terms of ensuring their health and long-term well-being. Uh, and, you know, we always try to identify and work with, with people like Dana uh, who are just our Dr. Long, who are doing incredible work, so we can help um, uh, spread that and spread that and connect them to more people and more partners uh, nationally uh, and share best these, these types of best practices. So, with that, I, I wanted to uh, I will uh, hand it over to uh, Dr. Dana Long. Thanks so much. All right, Dana, you should have um, control over um, slides now. So if you're able, you can um, pass them on through or I can. So um, welcome, thank you. So um, I am a pediatrician at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. And it's a huge honor to be able to be on this webinar um, with the Community Action Partnership and with Dr. Lombrada from HRSA. And we're really excited to describe our work to you. 
So today I'm on the webinar with two of my amazing colleagues, uh, Matt Espinoza and Jeremy Ames from Diggable, who are my technology partners. So I want to start by going over our objectives with you. And so first I want to get us all on the same page when we talk about social determinants of health. What does that really mean? Second of all, I want to discuss with you some of the fantastic research that we've done that have gone into um, not only explaining how we've integrated uniform screening and care connection and follow-up and population level analytics into our clinical flows, but to also do a live demonstration of Find Connect, um, which is our web-friendly platform, in order to give you all an example of what a capacity building tool could look like that could align us in having standardized screening and being able to look at hot spots about where the needs are, where we're doing the best, and where we need to put more resources into. Um, and then lastly, I hope that we can have a really robust conversation about opportunities to collaborate. So let me give you a little bit more background about how we started with this work. So I work in a safety net that is funded by HRSA. We are a fairly qualified health center in Northern California in Oakland. My hospital's been in the community for the last 100 years. And two years ago, we joined in this affiliation with UCSF. We are the largest regional safety net um, in our area. Um, our hospital has everything from primary care to quaternary care with over 41 different specialties. Within our fairly qualified health center, 98% of our families live below the poverty line. And so in the Bay Area, that means that 98% of our families make less than $24,000 a year for a family of four. And 90% of our patients are also um, patients of color. And we have just an absolutely amazing clinic. So I'm going to tell you guys a story because I feel as if we all can relate to stories and those of you all on the phone have experienced this situation in your everyday lives as well. So this is one of my patients. Her name is Aisha and Aisha is four. I saw her recently in our asthma clinic after an emergency room visit. Um, for her asthma, which is very poorly controlled, and it was actually her third emergency department visit this year. Aisha came to see me in clinic after she'd been prescribed some steroids for her asthma and a bunch of different inhalers, and I work in a teaching hospital, and so the resident came up to me and said, well, Aisha's still wheezing. The mom's not giving her her medicines, and so my plan is to do some education around asthma and to make sure she has refills on her medicine. And, you know, I shook my head and said, all right, um, I understand that that's very much our traditional medical model, but are we asking about her living situation. Did you actually find out that Aisha is currently living in a shelter, um, that the mother's going in and out of her health care insurance, um, that there's an immense amount of stress in the family, that the mother endorses that she's running out of money um, by the end of the month before that she can buy food, and that Aisha is having a bunch of learning issues in her preschool right now. These issues that we now refer to as social determinants of health profoundly impact health outcomes. The definition of social determinants of health that I think is the easiest to remember is that the determinants of health are essentially where we eat, sleep, play, and learn, and that these factors can contribute not only to our health outcomes, but also our economic outcomes and our educational outcomes. So these pictures, I'm sure that you guys have the same pictures in your community. So the pictures of the tents are right off one of the highways here in Oakland, and the other picture is the really high-income Oakland Hills. And these two pictures were actually only taken three miles apart. So within Oakland, a child that's born in the more affluent hill area compared to a child that's born in the flatlands will expect to have a life expectancy of 14 years fewer. And we see the ramifications of determinants of health and how they powerfully impact outcomes across the lifespan for our children. 
And so compared to a child that grew up in the Oakland Hills, a child that's born in the flatlands as an infant is two times more likely to be low birth weight, is 12 times less likely to have a mother who graduated from college, is 13 times more likely to live in poverty as a child, is four times less likely to read at grade level, is five times more likely to be unemployed and three times more likely to die of a stroke as an adult. And cumulatively, we see that there's a 14-year difference in life expectancy simply by living a few miles apart. And so the question begs itself, well, how are we as healthcare institutions actually going upstream and being preventative in our thinking in order to alter, to shift the traditional medical model to incorporate more team-based care around health inequities? So my journey to this work, I've been a pediatrician at Children's Hospital for almost 20 years now. And starting in 2012, I became incredibly dissatisfied with the current standard of care. And so we decided to do a randomized clinical trial within our urgent care, which is our fast track emergency room, in order just to take the first step, in order to see, well, what questions can we ask and how palatable are the questions to our families? What do they think about us asking these questions within a medical model? So the ice cream study, we enrolled over 700 families and we random, randomized them to either be asked these basic questions using an iPad or a tablet that was programmed in audio and visual in English and Spanish versus being asked the questions by a bilingual, bicultural, what we call navigator, a community member. And these questions range from questions about food insecurity and housing instability to questions about concerns about caregiver mental health, domestic violence, issues of immigration. And what we found to me was horrifying. Um, what we found is that in our emergency department setting, the amount of unmet social and environmental needs was profound and that our medical model currently didn't have a way of incorporating and addressing these questions. And so of all comers we, who were randomly approached, we found that almost 60% of our families endorsed that they were running out of food before they had money to buy more. We endorsed that over half of our families were concerned about their child's safety at home, at school, in their neighborhoods. 45% of our families were concerned about the mental health of the primary caregiver, and the little over 40% were concerned about the habitability of their housing. We also sort of asked families about the connection between these determinants of health and why they came to the emergency department today. And families actually endorsed at the time that they didn't actually understand. They didn't actually know what the correlation was. However, pretty much unanimously, they agreed that it was important for us to be asking these questions. When we asked them about the modality that they preferred, although disclosure rates were very similar on the tablet versus the in-person, families said they preferred the in-person, but they answered honestly, equivocally, um, e equivalently on both modalities. So this was really helpful information and we started to think, well, let's actually see how we can screen families and then pair families with interventions in order to see if we can, one, affect healthcare utilization and then to affect perceptions of child health. And so our next study, Um, our next study was actually just published this last fall in JAMA Pediatrics, and the primary research goal of that study was to do a comparative effectiveness of two social need interventions in order to decrease social needs and improve health. We randomized over 2,000 fam about 2,000 families across the Bay, so both at Children's Hospital Oakland and with our colleagues Dr. Laura Gottlieb at San Francisco General Hospital. And 
we had uh, four different locations. We had urgent care and primary care in Oakland, and then urgent care and primary care at San Francisco General. And the two arms that we were comparing were those arms were screened for interventions, and then one arm was screened and then paired up with a bilingual bicultural navigator who followed up with the family, who really built a relationship with the family um, and ensured that there were tailored resources for those families' unmet needs. The other arm that we call our control group were screened and then they were given resource directories, resource cards that were put out by 211. And we looked and we followed those families for up to four months, and then we pulled all of their healthcare utilization data pre and post intervention. What we found was that there was a huge level of unmet social determinants of health within our community. And we also found that there was a statistically significant difference um, for the intervention group that was paired with navigators in terms of resolving at least one major unmet social need. And the top three needs in our community were food insecurity, housing instability, and the ability just to keep the utilities on, the water running, the, the, the heat on. Um, and there was a statistically significant difference in the perception of child health outcomes in the treatment group when we resolve social needs. The healthcare utilization data um, we currently are analyzing, and I really hope to be able to report out on that data with you soon. We also asked families if they had been asked these questions when they came into their medical home previously. And only 18% of our families reported being asked about unmet needs in the last year. So moving on from this work, we decided that we wanted to actually dive more deeply into adverse childhood experiences. And so we actually felt that there was a pretty good evidence base for unmet basic needs, like food insecurity and housing instability, access to diapers, access to transportation, to activities, to parks. But how were we as pediatricians really focusing on, as Aaron had suggested, the dyadic relationship, the two-generational approach to child and caregiver, and how our child adverse childhood experiences related to their parents, their caregivers' adverse childhood experiences. And so working off of the great work that happened through the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, we looked at the traditional three categories of ACEs, those being abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And we decided that we were going to do another large randomized trial in order to develop a statistically validated prospective pediatric ACEs screening tool um, that could be used in children zero to 12 in order to help to predict um, which children are at risk for poor health outcomes. And so we modified some of the traditional ACEs questions in order for tonality and cultural responsiveness, and then we augmented those questions with social determinants of health questions, including questions about discrimination and violence. Um, and we are trying to create correlations between the child ACEs and the adult ACEs. We are collecting a slew of biomarkers, both epigenetic um, as well as immune, and then we're tailoring interventions for children um, based upon sort of care coordination with mental health care coordinators and sort of group, vi group visits within a primary care model that are focused on resiliency. We've done some pilots already, and our pilots have yielded some really instructive information for us through our qualitative interviews with families, where families are telling us essentially unanimously that, that yes, they want to be asked these questions, and that if they take the time to answer the questions, then we need to respect their time and their answers and actually provide them with interventions. And what providers are telling us, and this is very much akin to what the Robert Wood Johnson survey, um, Healthcare's Blindside said, is that providers have the knowledge that it's 
essential to address determinants of health and ACEs, but what providers need are capacity building tools in order to allow us to support families within a busy safety net setting. So we currently um, are piloting different ACEs questions and piloting capacities to have providers ask the questions and then how do we use technology in order to support getting families to the right place. And so we're going to show you a demo of what that looks like in a minute. I just want to show you guys some of our initial findings that for me, um, are very telling, and so you can see that the traditional ACEs study, um, when we categorize it by the types of questions, abuse, and that abuse is psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, substance abuse, mental illness, um, domestic violence, and then criminal behavior, we can see the percentages in the initial ACEs study. And for those of us that work in safety nets, we know that these numbers are multifold compared to the initial study population um, that the ACEs study occurred in. And I just think it's imperative that we find ways to support the medical home in more comprehensively really working with um, the diets of parents and children around ACEs and social determinants. You'll see interestingly that when we look at how families endorse mental health issues in the caregivers of children that compared to the initial ACEs study, our pilot data, which is the FIT study, FIT stands for the Feasibility of Implementing Tools, um, that our, our percentage was 17.85% versus 18%. And I think a lot of that has to do with the stigma around mental health and safety net populations um, and that we're really under-diagnosing under and under-treating folks. So ultimately, our goal is to support team-based care, to change the healthcare system from within in order to improve population health and health equity for all. So I founded um, and created Find Connect beginning in 2014, and then more recently started working with Matt and Jeremy, who are on the phone, um, who basically helped bring my vision to life. And the definition that we're using for Find Connect is that it's an innovative solution that empowers patients, care teams, and communities to collaboratively address the determinants of health. And the way that we do it is through having a suite of tools that allows for automation and then helping to support safety nets with the training and education that are necessary in order to embrace the tool. Our goal is to make connecting to resources for social and environmental determinants incredibly easy and effective. And so the tools that are part of the platform are one is a really robust needs assessment. And that needs assessment ranges from everything from the types of evidence-based questions that there are around food insecurity to child development. And then we're piloting within our research context, the questions about caregiver mental health and child mental health. And this is a super iterative process. We want to be able to support the trusting relationships that our communities already have with our safety nets. And so the purpose of Find Connect is to support that relationship by actually having action plans where navigators, community members, work directly with our patients in order to figure out how to resolve needs and then do the follow-up. So within my clinic, we have designated staff members who actually support the physicians and the ancillary staff in order to do the screening. I acknowledge that the idea of care coordination and case management is an old idea. And people have been doing this work for a very long time. And so when we created Find Connect, we really wanted to be able to create a way to support the work that discharge planners, that referral coordinators, that social workers were already doing. And we wanted to give them one place where they could go, where all of the resources that are in their file cabinets, that are on their sticky notes, um, that are in their heads or on random binders, that they're in one place, one cloud, with a standardized architecture so that everyone can have access 
to those knowledge base items. And the knowledge base are resources that are very well vetted. And so it's information about your local food bank with the phone number and the address and the languages that are spoken. Um, that gives the exact geolocation and so that we actually can tell families how to get there. And so these are resources that we can give families warm handoffs to and then actually trust that when families go there, they'll be treated with respect in the language that they speak um, with a contact person on the other end. The platform also allows for case management so that it will remind us, oh yeah, today I have to follow up with the Smith family or the Ramirez family. Because the system is geolocated and automated, it allows for scalability and we actually then can look at an entire region, an entire population, and look at sort of what the needs are and how those needs are shifting over time. And it allows for internal QI projects so that we can say, okay, well, in this community, the main issue really is access to after-school activities or tutoring or diapers. Let's invest more resources in those programs. Um, we also have created a manual that allows for tips for how to integrate into clinic, um, how to be more culturally humble in our approach, and then a user's guide to the platform itself. So all of our algorithms are customizable based upon the communities that are being served because every community is different and you guys know your community certainly better than I do. And so we want to put this technology in your hands in order for you guys to grow it so that it works for you. There's sophisticated real-time resource matching, um, these automated action plans, it's HIPAA compliant and it runs on any desktop lab, laptop or um, uh, or tablet. So the ultimate goal, and I think this is the goal that aligns with the Community Action Partnership as well as with the Bureau for Maternal and Child Health, is that we really want to shift the paradigm of medicine to more comprehensively support families. And we want to be able to integrate technology into clinical flows so that we can have a direct impact on health outcomes for every child. So I can't wait to field some questions about this, but I think the most helpful thing is for you all to see it. Um, and my hope is that this tool is just an example of what can be used and that it will help you guys to start thinking about, well, what can we do in our own clinics? So I'm going to pass it off to Matt. All right. Thank you, Dana. And um, I'm passing it over to Matt and Jeremy now, so you guys should be good to go. All right, just let me know when uh, you can see the browser. Yes, we see it now. Okay, hello, my name is Matt Espinoza, I'm the CEO of Diggable Inc, and we are the technology partners that have been working with Dr. Dana Long and her amazing team at uh, Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland to develop Find Connect. So what I'd like to do is uh, take you through the platform and then if there are any questions pertaining to specific parts of the platform, just uh, write the questions in the chat and then we can go over uh, them uh, once I finish the presentation because uh, currently I can only see uh, Find Connect and not uh, the uh, WebEx. <clears throat> so what you're seeing here is the reporting dashboard. That is the first thing that the, uh, the navigators or the user sees when they log in. This gives them an overview of the system uh, to really show them how it's going in the organization, um, how many families are coming in, uh, how many resources are being referred, <clears throat> and uh, how many active users are in the system. So the priority needs identified here, this is pertaining to the needs assessment survey uh, that Dr. Long has been uh, talking about uh, with the uh, needs listed here in an order of how many times they've been identified. Uh, we also have top 10 resource referrals, and these are the resources within our knowledge base that have been added to an action plan um, for the caregivers. Down below, we have data by zip codes, and this is where you really start to see the power of, uh, of Find Connect. Uh, as families come in and are, in, and are enrolled and uh, take the needs assessment surveys and answer questions, uh, those results begin to populate here in sort of a heat map format. So you can this is all around Oakland, but as you see, there's families being enrolled um, up here, Vallejo, 
And as you can imagine, as Find Connect starts to get used, you could really zoom out and see where these hotspots are in various areas of, of the state and even nationwide. The data here is separated by uh, enrollments and then the priority needs identified on needs assessment survey. So you can go through and really start to see which areas of the community are, are needing uh, resources pertaining to these concerns. Down below is the calendar, and this is for case management. So as you can see, there is an event occurring, so expiring uh, the Deerfield family. So an enrollment typically uh, has a time span of about three months, and this is all customizable within the system. But this allows the navigator to come in and see uh, anything that has to be done, any events, any follow-ups uh, or a communication that's required uh, for any cases that they're managing. So again, this is the reporting dashboard and very uh, easy to use and quick view of, of the system and how it's being run in your organization. As far as the enrollment process is concerned, when a family comes to the find desk, uh, we collect information on them. Uh, this is currently a manual process, but we're in uh, development of an EPIC bridge, so this would all be pulled directly from the organization's healthcare records. So we collect personal information, such as first, last, ethnicity, preferred language, insurance provider, again, all customizable according to the organization uh, and the community, and family income, and some of the fields are unknown declined, and that's so we get a full data set um, instead of having things left out. Uh, which race that they identify with, they can select one or many, uh, contact information, this is um, you know, how we get a hold of the caregiver. So email, primary, alternate, uh, their preferred contact method. And then any notes pertaining to how to contact them or best times to do so. Their location information, this is for um, our geolocation data. Uh, the organization details, this is all pre-populated by the system. Find Connect can support many organizations under one main organization. Uh, I'm the navigator. And then a referral method we collect um, on how they were referred to the, the find desk. We also collect some additional information here, uh, such as number of people in the household and other non-family children living in the household. And this is to help us understand a little bit more about the environment that the family and the children are living in. We then collect the children's information, their first name, last name, the relationship to the child, understanding that there could be um, many different relationships to the child, the MR number, the preferred gender, the racial identity, ethnic identity, and of course, the birth date of the child. <clears throat> so this is the enrollment process. Uh, we then save the record. I'll go ahead and show uh, an existing enrollment that we've done. So after you save the enrollment, you're then brought to the enrollment details. So this is the record of the family, which will stay here. All the information pertaining to any time they come into the find desk, Anytime their case is closed or reopened, it will all reside in this one record. <clears throat> so this is the information we just collected about the caregiver, along with their children information. And then we have the various modules, the needs assessment survey, the action plan, the ability to follow up and assess the case, as well as handing off. Down at the bottom, we have the archive. And again, this is where all of the records pertaining to this caregiver or family will exist. So any navigator, if they're handed the family and would like to go back through and see when they were brought to the find disk, what needs they have, what time they had them, uh, they can go back and review them easily here. So we'll go ahead and start with the needs assessment survey. <clears throat> so the first thing we ask is if they would like to opt in or opt out of the needs assessment survey. They don't have to take the survey um, in order to get an action plan or resources referred, but we'd, we like to collect information on it, why they'd be opting out, and so that would be done by checking here. We then start with my chart enrollment, you know, electronic medical record access. We then ask them for the needs that may concern their families. So we have food, child developmental health, activities outdoors, benefit legal, housing utilities, tobacco use, and then some ones we've added recently, diapers, car safety, and helmet safety. So as the navigator asks which concerns they have, they'll go ahead and check them. And then they populate below as far as the questions in their own sections here. So as the, as the caregiver answers the questions, yes or no, information is exposed here. Uh, in pink, these are talking points for the navigator. And this is to ensure a consistency of care uh, when families are enrolled. So all the same questions are asked, all the same um, resources are given. So I'd like to share some information about the Alameda County Food Bank with you, as well as information about local emergency food pantries through the food bank and community organizations. We also have this navigator needs section here. And what this is, is 
to alert the navigator that there are flyers that may be at their desk or around where they are that they can provide them right there while they're sitting with them uh, while they're taking the survey. So this is, these are all dynamic. So as you answer the questions, yes or no, more questions will be shown or removed. Some of the questions our system allows to be weighted. So do you need food today? So that's a pretty critical uh, question. So if someone answers yes, we, we can provide them with a bag of food from the clinic and then Navigator needs provide the food bag and then the Alameda County Food Bank referral number and information. So if they answer this question yes, then that will make this enrollment um, sort of high priority or critical. So our system will then assign follow-up uh, timelines pertaining to the severity of the case. So if it's a regular enrollment, the first follow-up after the needs assessment survey is taken would be two weeks. Uh, however, if they answered this question uh, yes, then that would be moved to one week. So they'll continue to, through and answer the questions about food, child developmental health, benefits, legal, priority, <clears throat> and other needs. So we selected five here. So at the bottom, we asked them to select their, their priority needs. So these are the three that they wish to have uh, accommodated right then and there through uh, during their visit there. So we'll go back and I will now go to um, the enrollment that was done originally, which has the needs assessment survey completed, the action plan completed, all the follow-up, et cetera. So again, back in the enrollment view, we have the needs assessment survey already taken. They identified child developmental health, food, housing, and tobacco cessation as concerns, and then child developmental health, food, food and housing as priorities. So then we would go to the action plan and generate it. So an action plan has already been done here, and we list the resources that were ad added to the action plan as well as if any action has been taken, which is a feature I'll, I'll go through right now. So when you create an action plan, we are showing recommendations from our system. Now, going back to the needs assessment survey, as the caregiver is answering the questions, our system starts to derive recommendations based on the resources in the needs assessment or in the knowledge base. So those are displayed here in blue. The ones that have been added to the action plan are in dark blue, and it's as easy as checking a box. It adds one gives you a description along with some navigator notes uh, for internal communication, as well as family notes, which are then added to the action plan, um, which is printed before they leave the find desk. So they can add as many or as few as they wish. Once they're completed, once they've completed the action plan, they would then save it, and it will take them to the action plan. So this view shows what the caregiver will leave um, the clinic with that day. All of the resources that were added to the action plan are separated by their, their category, so food, child development, and any other ones that were added outside of any concerns that they may have had. Uh, they're listed by name, their contact information, and then it, we have this feature where the caregiver can actually close the loop on resource utilization. What Find Connect can do is deploy a local area code phone number uh, within the community which and then assign a custom um, ID here. So this unique code here pertains to this family as well as the resource uh, being utilized. So when they go in and use the resource, they would then text this code to this number, and that would automatically tell our system that the caregiver has utilized the resource so that we can ask questions about it during any follow-ups that are done. You can print each individual uh, resource, you can print the entire action plan, and then any related PDFs uh, that are attached to the knowledge base resource. So going back again to the enrollment details, we see these are the, these are the resources that were added to the action plan, and according to our system, the caregiver has taken action on youth and family service counseling and 211. The next section is for follow-ups. So when a, when a navigator is following up with a caregiver, you can simply add one to the system. We then select how it was done, who it was with. So navigator to navigator would be a case assessment or navigator to caregiver would be a follow-up. Uh, the result of the follow-up along with any notes. And you're able to add this follow-up here right in this, in this screen so you can go back and look at what resources have been um, utilized. So you can ask questions. So um, they may have had problems with Head Start or Early Start or um, the farmer's market. And we would definitely want to know those things uh, during those follow-ups. And then as far as uh, case management, we have, a, we have a module here that will allow for the warm handoff. You know, we understand that uh, is a very important feature, a very important part of the process. 
and we, we want to make sure that uh, nothing falls through the cracks. So if uh, the caregiver comes in or calls and says that they have, um, you know, they've taken a new job or they've lost their child care and they can't come in on the same day, we can initiate a, a handoff to accommodate that. So you simply select the navigator in the system that would be available during the times that uh, the caregiver can come in. The reason for handoff, language skills, preferred scheduling, or any other reason, which you can put in here. And then any notes for the receiving navigator to help them, under, help them better understand the needs um, of the family that they are uh, taking care of. So once initiating the handoff, I would get an email since I'm the navigator, and then the receiving navigator would get one, letting them know that they, um, they have another um, family under their care. And a, a unique link would be within the email uh, that would then confirm the handoff and thus handing the family and all of their records over to the new navigator. Uh, the archive down below is again where the, the history of the family is stored and can be easily referenced. So that's the enrollment process uh, of a caregiver, the needs assessment survey, the action plan, follow-ups, and then handoffs. So we'll go ahead and jump over to the knowledge base. So the knowledge base as Dana mentioned, as Dr. Long mentioned, is a place for all of these wonderful, uh, culturally relevant um, resources of the community can be stored in one place. <clears throat> Up here at the top are tags, which you can quickly filter the results. And then if you go into one, it will show the details uh, pertaining to this resource. So who to contact, uh, their email, uh, any program specific information, start date, expiration date, uh, our system allows you to add an expiration date uh, for summer programs or seasonal things, so uh, they will automatically expire so they're not um, added to an action plan. Any helpful links such as a sign up link, uh, detailed information if there's any, and then eligibility information which are tags within the system uh, for such as age group, things such as age groups. I'll quickly go into uh, the knowledge base resource to show you all of the information that we can collect on the resource. So again, program name, a summary, a start and end date if it applies, the program eligibility, free or fee-based, if it's fee, the program fee, program hours, URL and the organization name, the contact information, the location information, uh, any detailed information that it has, uh, miscellaneous online links, eligibility information. So here's where uh, the, the resources are identified. So as you click, all of, the all of the tags within the system are then populated here for quick selection. So you can add them, eligible cities, same thing. The age groups, languages served, all pulled from the system and all customizable. Uh, the needs tags that apply to the knowledge or to the resource as well as subcategories, and then the ability to upload attachments to it, uh, such as PDFs or information in other languages. And uh, that is knowledge base um, functionality. So we've already been through the reporting dashboard, so I will go back over to... <clears throat> okay, so Find Connect supports uh, some administration functionality, uh, such as managing the users and then setting the, uh, the important information, such as the insurance carriers, uh, the the cities, the counties, and uh, the needs tags which were identified uh, in the knowledge base. So again, highly customizable through the system itself. You know, we wanted to make sure that as we scale, uh, there's not a need to rely on developmental efforts uh, and long timelines in order to quickly customize the system uh, for the community and get it up and running. So that, is our, that was our number one priority and that is Fine Connect. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Courtney. All right, thank you, Matt and Jeremy. We appreciate that. Um, and thank you for that demonstration of that great tool. Um, so what I'll do now is just pass it back over to Dana and I'll let you um, finish out the presentation. Perfect, thank you, everyone. So, there are a couple of comments that I just wanted to make about the demo, and then um, I want to open up the conversation to the folks that are on the phone. So one is that the platform itself, it's meant to be a tool that is used within a clinical setting in order to, like I said, support the relationship between that care coordinator, that staff member, and the family. 
So because our families come from multiple different places um, and our staff is also reflective of our community, the platform itself can be used in English, Spanish, Arabic, or Mandarin and Cantonese so that um, if we have an Arabic speaking staff member, they can actually speak with our Arabic speaking patients using the platform in a common language and going through the platform together. The ultimate goal of tools such as Find Connect are that basically we want to do innovations and clinical care and research with the potential to disrupt the link between adversity and poor health. So that no matter where our families come from, every child um, can reach their healthy developmental trajectory. There's a quote that I really like from Martin Luther King that says, of all forms of inequity, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane. I'm hoping that I can be a resource to those of you on the phone who are either developing your own system changing tools to be more preventative and more holistic as we go upstream. Um, or to help you use tools um, such as the ones that are already being created, like Find Connect. And out of this webinar, my biggest hope would be that there might be a handful of you that are interested in either piloting Find Connect or helping, um, having us help you think about tools that will work better for your situation, and then doing some pilots to see how we could scale them so that across safety nets we're using common matrix because if we all can figure out a way to ask the same questions, then we'll be able to aggregate data on a population level that can be used for advocacy that we then can give to folks like Aaron from the Bureau in order to make real policy change. So that's the goal. And at this point, Courtney, I'm, um, let's open up the floor for questions. All right, that sounds good. Um, does anyone um, have any questions? I didn't get any through the chat just yet, except for a couple about um, whether slides will be available after um, the webinar. Um, but it looks like looks like we had a couple questions come through um, the question box, and so just in case people um, are unable to see those. Okay, so one question came through asking, is there a means to communicate resource use other than text? Cell phone ownership and service are both issues with many of our rural populations. So Matt um, responded back to her in the question box and said that yes, resource can be communicated and noted in the enrollment during follow-up between the navigator and caregiver. The SMS or cell phone uh, resource utilization was developed as an additional means to close the loop. So I have a couple um, other responses too. I completely agree with those that you just listed off, Courtney. I would also say that when families are sitting in clinic with these navigators, the action plan, it actually prints out into a beautiful PDF. And so we are handing families that action plan when they leave after their child visits. Um, and so families are actually getting the re like physical copies of the resources. They can be emailed to families. And then one thing that we didn't talk that much about is how are we actually documenting through the electronic medical record. And so those action plans at this point, they can be pushed into the EMR. Um, so that the PDF, if you open up for those of you that we have EPIC, but for whether it's next gen or whatever EMR you have, um, you can open up your note writer and at this point just plot the action plan in as a documentation note so that we know that um, we know what issues were discussed and what the plan was for those issues. There were a couple other things about communication um, that I just wanted to highlight that aren't directly related to, related to this question, but I think they're important. And so the first is that through our EMR, we actually can refer to the FINE program. Um, FINE stands for Family Information Navigation Desk. That's where we're using this platform. And so we can, we can refer families to schedule appointments through FINE. Um, and we can actually, the staff can 
um, communicate with the fine staff through the EMR. So those are two important wins for us. Um, we are working really closely in order to have bi-directional communication, and so that is, that's on the horizon, and that will be completed within this next phase that we're in. Can you talk a little bit more about that, um, Dana? Sure. So the way that it currently stands right now is that Referrals are made just like if I'm in clinic and I'm referring a family to orthopedics, I can do that referral, it's automated through EPIC. And so just like orthopedics, we can actually refer to FIND. That referral then sits in the inbox of the staff and then that staff can communicate directly with the family. Um, so that's a, that was a really big deal for us. The other way that we're documenting referrals to the fine desk is when providers, whether it's a nurse, a nurse practitioner or a physician, when we're actually writing our notes in the note template, when we come up to our action and plan, um, in the plan section, there it says psychosocial, and then there's a drop-down menu for psychosocial services. And so find is one of those items that's on the drop-down menu so that we can actually document that the provider refers the family to find during their visit. Um, so that, so those are the ways that we've currently have integrated. We also are asking families for their medical record number um, within the Find Connect system. And I've been working with our EMR team in order then to be able to run reports on our families so that I, since I have the EMR number, I can actually run a report that says for these families, these are their top medical diagnoses, these are how their outcomes shifted and changed pre and post enrollment within the fine desk. And I think that's a huge deal when we look at healthcare utilization and return on investment. Yeah, definitely, I agree. All right, well, hey, Courtney, um, oh, oh. Sure, go ahead. Oh, this is Aaron. I, I, I wanted to also ask Dana a question. Um, uh, the, the, the benefits of, being, of having this tool within a clinical setting, within a clinic, is, 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 has huge advantages, as you just noted, and, and being able to align it with the clinical information, looking at health outcomes. But is it not true also that um, this tool can be used even if you're not uh, like a health clinic? So, so I'm just asking because some of the community partners on the call on the thing part of the webinar today, they may not be um, uh, like health clinic. Uh, that they're, they're, they're the, the hub in the community, the community organizing in the community. They may not be the, the clinic. It could be a home visitor, Head Start. Um, could this tool be used by by uh, other groups uh, in the community, leaders in the community that uh, work with provide services to people, or is it, or do you think it's limited to uh, clinical uh, or clinics? So I love your question, and although you can't see my webcam, I'm actually, I actually have a huge grin on my face because I, I, I very deeply believe that Fine Connect does not just belong in healthcare. It was created with the intention that we want the food banks to use Fine Connect. We want the libraries to use Fine Connect. We want the schools to be able to use it. I am so eager to be able to roll a system out whereby we can actually really galvanize resources and help people achieve better health. I've been having a lot of meetings, for instance, with our local food bank, and the staff of the food bank tell me, you know, people come here for food, but if you're coming to the food bank for food, then you, you probably have housing issues and you probably have... Um, you probably don't necessarily have access to transportation or diapers or child care. That all of these determinants of health are related and we're so focused on our silos that if you have a mom with five kids and she's currently homeless and going to the food bank, why is it that she has to go to the food bank to get this resource, WIC to get that resource, the school district to get this resource? It, it becomes untenable. And so wouldn't it be wonderful if when she goes to the food bank, she also can get signed up for, um, 
you know, for, for, for a transportation program, for to fill out a Head Start application, like all in one central location. And so for those of you on the phone from community sites, I would love to see how this platform can be customized and adopted and rolled out everywhere. Yeah, and Dana, I would say that community action agencies are um, almost the perfect hub for something like this. Um, because oftentimes community action agencies are those organizations that are giving out referrals to different, um, you know, food banks and um, daycare centers and um, career centers and things like that. Um, and, you know, some states or agencies have ways of tracking that electronically and some do not. Um, and so that's, um, I do think this could be a wonderful tool for community action agencies. Um, and we have a couple of questions about, um, about the cost um, as well as um, the um, process for becoming a pilot organization um, for Find Connect. Great. So the costs are, I don't know if this is actually a real term, but I made it up that we want this technology, I mean, like I refer to it as being community-driven technology. We want it to be adopted and owned by each individual community um, who can then tailor it to their needs. Our goal is to be able to scale it. We are not vendors. Um, we just want it to be used. There are some minimal hard costs that are essential for data encryption and hosting your own server, which are just protections of privacy, and those are essentially it. Okay, great. And then how do organizations adopt it was the second part of that question. And really it's just get in contact with Matt, Jeremy, and I, and we will love to um, walk you through the platform, to help you set it up on your server. I mean, we can do all the heavy lifting. We just want it to be used. Okay, great. Um, and I think one opportunity to connect further is through the peer-to-peer um, -peer subgroup. So um, I think this would definitely be a topic of conversation once we engage in that subgroup call. Uh, we don't have a date set yet. We wanted to kind of get an idea of who all is interested in participating in that. Um, so if you are on the line um, and in this event, please send me an email after the event or you can connect with me on Basecamp once I, once I um, invite you all to join that. Um, and let me know um, whether you're interested um, in participating in that and then I'm sure this will be part of that discussion um, as well as discussing what types of um, different initiatives the agencies are out there doing um, in the community to help connect resources and um, help try to make an impact on some of these social determinants of health um, and that holistic approach. Um, so definitely let us know if you're interested in that and then of course you can follow up further with, um, with Dana and Matt and Jeremy to um, talk more about this um, Find Connect tool. Um, so we have one other question um, that's come in. Uh, first part was about the cost which you already um, answer, but somebody asked also if, have you been able to show a decrease use in emergency room visits to justify the cost, or has there been other impacts that help to justify this cost? So that's such a good question, and it's exactly where our head has been. So when we were doing our second randomized controlled trial, which we did with the General Hospital in San Francisco and Children's Hospital Oakland, we pulled all of the healthcare utilization data pre and post enrollment for the two comparison groups. So the one group that just received a resource directory versus the other group that received navigators who were working um, to help families resolve the needs. And so we pulled all that healthcare utilization data and we currently are writing the paper. We just submitted a paper to pediatric emergency medicine for all of our patients that were enrolled in the urgent care settings. And so hopefully we'll hear soon whether or not that paper um, is going to be published. So yes, we do have that data. Some of it is just embargoed until we hear about publication. Okay, great. And once you have that resource, um, maybe would you be willing to share it on the Basecamp site? Yes, I would. Great. 
Great. Well, um, any final questions? I don't see any that have come through, but um, as I kind of wrap up, I will watch for any more and we'll do one more pause for questions at the end. Um, so if you do have any final questions, um, go ahead and type them in now. And I'll go ahead and start on some of our closing remarks and uh, get back to um, towards the end of this here. So go ahead and type in your questions if you have any um, further. Um, and just to let you know, as far as our upcoming meetings go, um, we do have um, more webinars that are going to focus on different intersections with health. So the next one is on May 31st and it's going to focus on the intersection between health and housing. And this one is going to be facilitated by Enterprise Community Partners, and they're going to have one of their uh, local examples on the phone to share as well. And so I haven't, um, actually I do have the full description up here, I'll show it in just a moment. Um, but we're going to do the same time frame, and then we also have one in June, um, Thursday, June 22nd, that is on health and substance abuse. Um, and so um, then, of course, we want your help determining what intersection we're going to focus on for July based on um, the needs of the group that is interested. So this is a little bit about um, the health and housing um, one that's coming up. And so I won't read through it all, and it'll be on the slides that um, you can get out of the base camp site. Um, but basically, um, this will really focus in on, you know, of course, still talking about health disparities and poor health outcomes, but how um, housing is one of those specific determinant, determinants of health um, that can really um, have a positive or negative effect on health later in life. And so I'm going to focus in on that and talk about health action plans in the process that they have um, designed at Enterprise Community Partners. So again, of course, I've mentioned this whole time, this tool called Basecamp. Um, and so you can just go to basecamp.com to get to this site and um, create an account so you have a sign in. It is free, uh, it's a free resource and it should work um, well with any kind of browsers. So what I'll do is I already have a group created on there and all the attendees from today's webinar, I will add to that. So you should get an invitation email um, at your email that you use to register for this event. And then you'll be able to access the slides, um, your peers, any resources that are uploaded, um, as well as the subject matter experts through this um, uh, kind of project management site. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like once you get in. There's um, room for discussion forums. So if anybody has any questions they want to pose or discussions they want to start, um, feel free to do that. Um, and then there's a place for files, events, um, and things like that. We also have a learning community blog, which will keep resources and updates about this um, health intersections learning community on the blog. So uh, feel free to check that out, though. It's the lcrcweb.com. Um, and please subscribe to it so you'll receive regular updates. And through this, you'll also have access to the other learning community um, resources and updates as well. So we're also going through a Learning with the Learning Community National Webinar Series right now. And basically what this is, is it uh, helps to share what the learning communities have been working on over the past 12 to 18 months. Um, we have some of these learning communities that have been um, in progress since January of 2016. And they have gone through, um, some of them have gone through goal plans and piloting processes and are now in the practice transformation phase of their work. And so they're wanting to share with you what they have implemented or what they have found through some of their um, work and learning around these different topics. And so we have a couple coming up in May. And the one on May 24th is on financial empowerment for families. Um, this has been a really engaged group that's uh, learned a lot and gone through some different curriculums. Um, and then on May 25th, we're having um, our learning with the learning community on trauma-informed approaches to alleviating poverty. So I encourage you to mark your calendars for that. You can find more information on the Learning Community blog, uh, as well as the Community Action Partnership website. Of course, we always have our shameless plug for our um, annual convention. And this year it is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and it's going to be August 29th through September 1st um, at the Philadelphia Marriott uh, downtown. And so you can um, access more information on that um, at the communityactionpartnership.com website. 
And at our annual convention, we'll have a um, learning community practice transformation mini general. So the participating agencies that have worked through um, some of these closed learning community groups will be um, doing brief IGNITE method agency presentations. Um, and so sharing kind of their successes and challenges, lessons learned. Um, and so it's kind of this um, giant panel discussion with real brief presentations. So I encourage you, um, hopefully, if you're coming to our annual convention, to make sure you visit that session um, as well. All right, so I'll go ahead and look through and see if we have any final questions. And I'm not seeing any in the chat. Um, and then, let's see, we do have uh, one in the question. Let me get to it. Um, so this is about, um, so Basecamp talks about a 30-day free trial. It is a free resource regardless. Um, and just to let you know, and then also, will this webinar be available as a recording? Yes, it will be. Um, so we recorded, started the recording from the beginning, and we'll add the recording to the Basecamp site as well. All right. I don't think we have um, any other questions. And just a side note on this, you know, since we have the recording and the webinar slides that are going to be available to you, feel free to share those with your colleagues or peers that you think might be interested in this information as well. Um, so this is an open learning community group, and we want as many people to benefit from it as possible. Um, and I think at this point, I'll turn it over to Aaron or um, Dana, see if you guys, either of you have any further questions or comments. Uh, this is Aaron. Um, I, I don't have any other uh, comments, uh, really, other than to say that I, again, I, I just, I wanted to say thank um, uh, Dana and, um, and, and, her, and her team, and I'm sorry, I've heard your guys' names in Connecticut who, or, who did the demo. Um, it, it's just, I, I'm, every time, I'm just the second time I've seen this presentation and the demo, and it just, uh, it so impresses me. It's just, it's such an incredible tool. Um, and, I, you know, we do, again, with our programs, we support a lot of this work. Uh, at the community level, um, it, whether through home visiting uh, um, or, you know, with our partners through, you know, with Head Start, ensuring that families have access to, you know, child care. Um, but again, a lot of times it, it's just, it's, what, what's lacking sometimes is, the, is the, the, the grantees and organizations we work with don't have a tool to address, to untrack, you know, to, to work with families, identify uh, some of the social determinants. Or, or problems that they're facing, uh, and then and it's identifying is one thing, but then being able to link them to services and then follow up. I, I mean, having a tool that tracks that, and then in addition, if it's in a clinic, you know, linking it to health outcomes, um, it, it's just an incredible tool. And I, and I think it's something uh, uh, that we, I think we're going to try to work, look into more uh, at MTHB of, of you know, promoting and, and trying to do more research on it as well to see the, how it impacts uh, families and children in terms of, you know, health outcomes. Um, and uh, I just think it's really great. So I just wanted to say thank you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to even take part in this webinar. So thank you again. Absolutely. I just want to second what Aaron um, just said and that I'm really humbled and appreciative of the opportunity to talk to you all. and. Over the course of doing this research and creating this tool, I've become very aware that change is tangible. We just have to be smarter and more efficient. And I feel like if there's a way that we could get out of our own silos and actually start to not only impact families one-on-one -on -one as we go through needs, but then to be able to generate broad population-level data it's a very powerful thing, um, and I just look forward to working with you all. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Erin, for um, sharing all of your expertise and um, being willing to connect with the National Community Action Network. Um, so I think that this is um, hopefully going to be an ongoing uh, relationship we can continue with, and um, we look forward to connecting um, further through Basecamp and a peer subgroup call. Um, so I think with that, we are um, going to go ahead and complete our webinar today. Just um, a 
little note here too on the screen, you see the LCRC staff contact info. So if you have any questions or follow-up, or if you don't receive the Basecamp invite, um, please email me. Um, I am Courtney Kohler, so I'm the last one listed there, the senior associate. Um, or of course, you can reach out to Tiffany Marley or Hyacinth McKinley as well. Um, but definitely reach out if you have any questions or don't receive that Basecamp invite. Um, and we'll make sure everyone gets the resources um, as well as the survey that we're going to send out for more information um, for the rest of our learning community. And then um, please let us know through Basecamp or email if you'd like to participate in the subgroup call, and then we'll get a date set up for that. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Again, thank you.